Good afternoon. Welcome back to another edition of the BNH Virtual Event Space. You are watching from inspiration to execution, hosted by Sony. And for that, we welcome to the virtual stage Sony artisan of imagery, Monica Sigmund. Monica, how's it going? Hello, hello. It's awesome. I'm glad to be here. Great to have you back. I, I know things are usually kicking over there. So how's, how's it been lately? Busy over there? It's crazy. This is probably the busiest first quarter we've had in maybe ever. It's it's just really, really going well. And um, I think people are feeling good. They're getting back to normality. And I know that we have been, um, you know, making ourselves busier with projects and that kind of stuff, which is a little bit about what I wanted to talk about today. Well, then it looks like we got the right person for the job. So I'm going to kick it over to you and remind everybody that we will be taking any and all questions that you have. So feel free to question, comment, whether you're joining us here on Zoom or one of our live streams over there, Facebook uh, live stream, whatever we have going on over there. But I'm going to step aside, let Monica take over and uh, so you admit it for some Q&A. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to get over here and share my screen. So let's see, Derek, you should see the Sigmund Taylor we do. Um, logo. Okay, perfect. perfect. So super excited to be back with you guys. And um, we've actually set up 10 webinars, one a month through the rest of the year, and um, they're all new content. So I'm really, really excited about that. And today I thought we'd kick it off with how to get ideas that are in your brain out to execution, out to the marketplace and really um, and execute those things so that we're just not kind of keeping them as daydreams, right? So for those of you who um, don't know us, just real quick, this is how you can find me on Instagram. That's probably the best way to, to find me is to, if you have any questions, direct message me there. This is my husband, Michael Taylor, and our two dogs, and we are a photographer family. So our sole source of income is our family portrait business, and uh, that's how we make our living. So I wanted to just share a couple of quick slides to just orient you. We are in Williamsburg, Virginia, and this is our studio. It's kind of just one big room. We use the front part um, as the studio when we are shooting and we're by appointment only. So when we're not shooting, it's just our gallery. For about 20 years, we've been known for this kind of sweet afternoon lighting, especially larger families, grandparents. Being in Williamsburg, it's a nice place for people to vacation. We have a lot of grandparents that are settling in this area because their children are among, you know, kind of along the East Coast. So we do get a lot of family reunion clients. And then, you know, we just have really pretty surroundings here. So like I said, we kind of became known for these outdoor lighting, warm kind of backlighting portraits. And then a few years ago, I guess about five or six years ago, it occurred to us that really, although we loved our outdoor portrait work, many of the prospective clients couldn't tell the difference between our outdoor portraits and somebody else's outdoor portraits. And that became a problem. We needed a way to really differentiate ourselves in the marketplace. So at that time, we launched a new line called Black Label. It's all studio work. It's more dramatic in its feeling. I know those of you who have heard me speak before, you guys are familiar with this line. But for those of you who haven't, this became a really, really popular line very quickly because it was something that people hadn't seen before. Um, may, mainly one light source and just really cinematic in its feeling, soft expressions, not big smiles. Um, and it's something that I had wanted to do for a long time, but it took a while to, for me to bring it to fruition and, and a, a couple of different things had to happen in order for that to come about. So that's kind of what I want to share today. And I wanted to start with this question. For any of you guys watching, what is it inside of you that you haven't brought to fruition yet? Is it is there an idea? Is there a style? Um, is it a new product line? Maybe it's just something as simple as you always photograph in color and you've wanted to try that black and white kind of fine art feeling. What is it that you've been too scared to try? 
And I think if you can write that down or share it with somebody, you know, just really be honest with yourself at this moment, then I'm pretty sure by the end of the hour, we'll have some good ideas for you guys to really start initiating that. So the first thing is kind of choosing what it is that you want to focus on, what it is that you want to bring about. And people think that it's really easy, right? We think, oh, you have you start with something that inspires you and then bam, you start photographing that the next day. But it's really not that. It's really a lot longer and a much more involved process. So I always think that first, after your inspiration, after something's just kind of caught your eye or has been planted in your brain a little bit, there's time that you have to allot to research and study all of that. Then there's development because you don't want to just copy something that you've seen. You want to make it yours and you need to practice it. So what is it going to be when you put your spin on it? And then there's the refinement. So we're close, but we're not perfect yet. And how do we just put those last pieces of polish on it before we bring it to the marketplace in the execution stage? So for anybody, I wanted to enumerate this because for anybody who has felt discouraged before that they've had an idea and it just didn't work or it didn't catch on, I would say you probably were in such a hurry because you were so excited to bring it about. Maybe you tried something, you put one image on Instagram and it didn't initiate any phone calls to your studio. So you think it's a failure and that's not necessarily the case, but I would suggest that we just need a little bit more time on the back end before we bring it bring it to the market. So that's what I wanted to talk about. So let's start with inspiration. Inspiration can come from a million different places. I'm going to use my black label portrait line as an example through these slides, just so you can see kind of my thought process, but you're going to find out this, this is kind of with everything. So for instance, I love all of these Vanity Fair kind of cover spreads. I know many of you guys out there do also, you love this group posing and um, just the dramatic nature of it. And so for years, I would just study this work and I kept thinking, well, why is it that we can't have work like this for our clients? Why is it that these iconic portraits, if you will, are served just for the clients of Annie Leibovitz or Mark Seliger? Why is it that we only see them in the magazines? And so by just studying and studying and studying this work, you can get inspiration from anywhere. And for me, oftentimes it's movies, the lighting and the crown and the darkest hour and girl with a pearl earring are just a couple of examples that, you know, I walked away from an episode with the crown and there was just this beautiful pose of the whole family as, as he was walking out of the room. And I just thought, oh, why can't we po pose a, a, a family like that? Why does it have to only be in the movies? Why do we have to use that lighting only in the movies or whatever? So there's inspiration all around us. And it can be something as simple as ripping pages from magazines and putting them up on a wall, putting them up on a board, but just surrounding yourself with work that is inspiring to you, that is exciting to you, will start to work its way into your subconscious. Another thing that Michael and I like to do whenever we travel is we like to go to whatever museums are in that area and just, again, study and get inspiration. This is the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and we came away from this. Let's see if I can find my mouse over there. Well, maybe not. Um, if you look at the bottom left hand uh, image there on the red wall, we came away with that just loving the idea of a salon wall being hung um, with different images and that the the portraits of most importance were placed at eye level. And the portraits of least importance were placed below because if you were only walking through a grand salon, then those were the portraits you would see at eye level. So we were really inspired by that and came back and did that in our studio in one of our gallery walls. And it's nothing new. We've seen it before, but sometimes you just need to see things over and over again. And sometimes depending on where you are, what, what, time of your life or whatever, just different things speak to you and you might recognize something that you hadn't noticed before. 
So for me, I love the old masters. John Singer Sargent is a huge, huge influence to me. I love all of his work. Whenever I can, I will um, go to a museum that has his work to see it in person. And I just, there's so much depth to it that it really speaks to me. Same thing with Rembrandt and Gainsborough too. So it's not just modern work that can influence. It's it's all of the things that we enjoy. Notice maybe the color palettes that you decorate with. Notice what appeals to you when you're thumbing through a books on a shelf at a bookstore or whatever, if anybody goes to a bookstore anymore. And just try and start seeing, <coughs> excuse me, what it is that attracts you. It doesn't mean that you have to photograph in this style, but what is it that attracts you? As you start to find those points of reference, then we can start to get in a little bit more detail. We can start to look at really studying and doing some more research. So we started with this inspiration. So say I was inspired by Annie Leibovitz and Mark Seliger and John Singer Sargent. So then it's like, okay, well, how do we study that more? I love just using Google images because it gives me that bird's eye view. If I type in Annie Leibovitz and I just click on that images tab, then all of the images come up as a body of work. And what I like about this is obviously I study the, the individual images, but um, what I like about this bird's eye view is it just kind of says to me, okay, what's the, what's the commonality here? What are the themes? Why am I attracted to it? Is it color? Is it composition? Is it um, the cropping? Like what is it about her work that speaks to me? Same thing with Mark Seliger, you start to look at the work and you can see the, the commonalities and see, okay, well, wow, there's, there's a moodiness to these images. There's a vulnerability that he's getting in these expression that really appeals to me. Might not necessarily be the sets and the clothing, maybe it's just that expression. When I look at John Singer Sargent, I just love this, these serious emotional renderings of the people that he's painting. And when I look at his work overall, I start to see similar similarities with the way, particularly that he's painted women. And I just feel like, oh, this is so much emotion that I wanted to bring forward in my work. So as you start to research and study these images, not just online, but get the coffee table books and live with those books and flip through those pages over and over, it's not that you want to get on set and copy those images. It's that when you get on set and you start shooting, you will recognize what's familiar because you've building the, you have been building these templates in your brain, if you will. So for instance... Um, whoops, I lost a little slide here. Hang on. So if I look at John Singer Sargent's work, this portrait on the left, and then I pulled this image from Mark Seliger for Vanity Fair, and then I found this image from Annie Leibovitz. It's pretty interesting, right? It's, it's very similar in its feeling, even its posing. But to me, it's just, look, there's no smiles. It's just soft expressions. It's lots of leaning and lounging and um, curious expressions to the camera. And what is it that they're trying to say? And they each of those images pull me in and make me wonder, you know, what's the story here? And I just, I, found, I, I find that that's so interesting. Same thing here. We've got images by Mark Seliger and Annie Leibovitz, and then look at this image by John Singer Sargent. It's not to say that anybody copied the other. It's just to say that there are these influences that after studying just become these templates in our brain, these reference points in our brain. And all of those things culminate to make up who we are and, and the work that we want to create. I look at this portraits um, from Les Mis that Annie Leibovitz took of Hugh Jackman, and I go, huh, doesn't that look familiar? And so she didn't sit down to copy that, but it's that feeling. And those are the feelings that appeal to me. So again, just another quick example here, and you can see how similar these are. So I just, I find this fascinating. I think this is really interesting. And even these, these multi-page uh, magazine spreads that we've seen over the years on Vanity Fair, 
you know, they all come from someplace. And so when you start to research and when you start to study the influences that are appealing to you and you can dig deep and you find the next layer, well, where did those influences come from? And where did that lighting style come from? And where did, where did what this posing looks familiar to us? Why is that? Where is that from? And you start to just really dig and dig and dig and you find whole other levels of inspiration for you to draw on. So as you start doing that, you know, it's, it, this is not a novel trick by any means, but a really great tool that I've used has been Pinterest where I can collect the work. I can collect the work from different artists, whether they're contemporary artists or classical artists. And I can start to, again, get that bird's eye view. What's the work that I like? I get, um, I can be guilty if I'm not careful of trying to make everything too perfect. And so I don't collect it on a board until I decide, well, I'm going to have this board for, you know, couples or this board for family. And it's not about that. It's about what's appealing to you. Just, just pull the images that you enjoy and put them on a board and then go back with that bird's eye view and see, okay, what is it? What's speaking to you? For me, it's this dramatic lighting. It's the expressions that have, like I said, just that, that glimpse of vulnerability. Um, and it's just more interesting posing, more dynamic posing than I see in traditional portrait photography in today's world. So those are all things that were going to influence me as I put together Black Label. Another trick that I have always found helpful when you're going through Instagram, be more intentional. Just don't just scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. Find out the, the people whose work you're admiring, find out who they're following. Just go click on that, um, that, that tab right there where it says who the, it says the number of people they're following. If you click that, it'll bring up all of those people. And you can start to rabbit hole and say, well, who, who is inspiring to them? Who are they interested in seeing? Um, and, and whose work are they following? And I, I have found some really beautiful accounts that way. And so whenever I, I find that I'm just sitting there scrolling and not really paying attention to anything, I try and just kind of yank myself back and say, okay, Monica, what is it that we want to search for today? What is it that we want to learn or, or discover today? Um, and so I think that that's just a little tip that I've found that's helpful. So I'm going to stop for just a second. This is a good place to just take a quick um, pause, if I can get out of my share screen. There we go. And um, because we're going to go into development and execution here in a minute. But um, I just wanted to see, Derek, are there any questions about that or um, anything that I should expand on more? No, I, I think you're already doing a great job getting us inspired. So. Okay. I think you're on the right track here. Perfect. All right. So let's keep going. All right. So you should see that, right? Sigmund Taylor again? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So let's get into development here. So we've got our inspiration. We've done our research. And again, this isn't stuff that's happened overnight. And so we're asking this question, what is it that you've always wanted to do? What's the work that you've wanted to be known for that you've been scared to try? And so I think that for me, I always look for, I think things need purpose. Um, it enables you to communicate that with your audience more clearly of why the work is important. And it enables you to stay on track and stay focused when you're trying to make decisions. So the purpose for me when I came up with Black Label and now um, I'm working on another line. And so often I find that we're getting into a little bit of a rhythm of complacency. And so we need to get out of a rut. And so we need to try something that makes us excited again, excited to create. And I also would say, what is the work that you want to be known for? When you leave this earth, what is the legacy you want to be leaving behind you? What is it that you want people to reference when they think of you? 
Also, this is a great way to try something new. For those of us who are running portrait studios, this is our living. We often feel like we don't have that time to try something new because we're too busy making a living doing what we're already known for. So like I said earlier, we were really known for that outdoor portrait work and nobody asked for studio work because we weren't showing any studio work. So you have to carve out that time to create the product that you want to then show them that you want for them to then ask for. And so it's not immediate. It does take intentionality and it takes time. For me, the criteria is whatever we're bringing new to our studio has to elevate us and the brand. It has to elevate our whole studio. I want it to be iconic. I want it to be something that um, when they think back about their child at five years old, that it's that reference point is the portrait we created. You know, we look at the celebrity portraits, like when we think of Kurt Cobain, we all think of that black and white image right before he died that Mark Seliger took. That was the one that was used all throughout that media coverage. And so when we think of him now, that's the image that comes to our brain. And so I want those iconic images for our clients. And so I'm really studying how can we make it just so different and so unique and so memorable and distinct that that will be the reference point for that person at that time. It needs to be different than anything you're doing already. And it needs to be easily, easily recognizable. So whatever it is that you're putting out into the marketplace, whatever this new idea is, this new inspiration, you need to create enough work that it's recognizable and that, um, and that it's different than what you already do. When you're able to do all that, then you start being seen as an artist, not just a photographer. People are seeing you be busy and creative. That's really important. Social media, I love what happened during COVID. It seems that all of this behind the scenes and all of our social media just became much less polished, right? It became much more organic. It was much more real. And I think that takes away some of the obstacles and the barriers that we have of wanting to post about what we're doing. I used to always think, well, the video isn't perfect or you know, this, this wasn't, this room was messy or whatever that I didn't wear makeup that day. And so now I feel like there's really no excuses. We really just need to be showing what we're working on. And even if we don't want to reveal the whole line, there's bits and pieces we can be showing about behind the scenes that get people really excited. People want to do business with people who are busy right? Nobody wants to invest a lot of money with somebody who they're not sure is going to be in business in six months. So we need to be staying busy. Even if we're really not busy, then we need to make ourselves busy. And I think executing an artist project or something like this, a new product line is the best way to do that. It keeps you shooting. It keeps your marketplace watching and seeing what you're doing. And all of that helps to just elevate you as an artist. We want to keep our reputation and brand just elevating, elevating all of the time. We, we're always looking at how can we take it up a notch. Um, Black Label has been out now for five years this, um, this past month, February. And in fact, last week, we just taught our very, very first Black Label workshop. And we, um, we accepted 10 studios uh, excuse me, 10 photographers to come and learn the Black Label brand inside and out, and then take that back to their communities. And it was just kind of the perfect anniversary of, wow, it's been out for five years. It was my baby. I'm ready for other families to enjoy that with photographers who have been trained the right way. And while I will still love it and I will always still do it, I'm also ready to flex my creative muscles and do something new. And so I'll share that with you in a little bit. Um, but these kinds of projects will sharpen your skill set and then ultimately satisfy your need to create. Because I don't know about you guys, but I didn't open a studio so I could be an accountant or so I could worry about payroll or insurance or any of that. I became a photographer because I wanted to photograph people and families and children. And so sometimes we have to just get back to why we got in this business in the first place. So with all those ideas and inspiration, now what? 
like for me, if I don't, if I don't, um, act on those pretty quickly, I can start to just get really, I can feel it in my mood. My mood changes when I'm not shooting, when I'm not, um, bringing something out. And so I get pretty grumpy. I get pretty, um, tired, pretty lethargic, pretty just depressed. And so I think we get a little paralyzed And so I wanted to share with you some different ways that you can get those ideas, all of that energy that you have built up inside of you, out of you to your marketplace to get you creatively satisfied and hopefully um, do some great things for your business too. So three things, model calls, invitational portraits, and artist projects. Those are three of the main ways we use to experiment, try new things, try new ideas, um, keep ourselves fresh, keep ourselves busy. I always laugh because um, I used to photograph weddings 23 years ago. I did weddings. And as I started to phase out of them, I think my busiest year, I took 35 weddings. And then by the last year, I had four. And I, even though I was much more experienced, I feel like I was a much better wedding photographer earlier on when I had weddings every weekend than just once in a while. And so I think the same thing with these um, model calls and invitational portraits and artist projects, what they help us do is just continue to shoot. I'm a better person when I'm shooting and when I'm creating. And so if I start to get slack or if business is slow, like it typically is at this time of the year, I've got to go make things happen for me to shoot. I've got to come up with reasons to shoot. And, and you've got to be creating all the time. You just got to be shooting all the time. It sounds so simple, but, um, but it's so important. And that can really be the difference with, with your entire mood and your business for the rest of the year. So, okay, well, what do we, what do you, how do you start model calls, invitationals, artist projects? Well, the first thing you have to do is find people. You have to find people that'll participate in these and, and get some people in front of your camera. And so that can be as easy as putting out a model call just on social media or through your existing audience and say, Hey, I'm looking for this very specific thing or, um, putting on social, you know, I'm looking for children ages four to seven and, all of those things work really well. You just have to decide what your currency is because I've had photographers who have done model calls and they've gotten frustrated because they haven't had a lot of sales from those. And the thing is, I always say, well, what's your currency for this project? Is your currency cash? Like you need money in the bank. That's probably not the best way to go about it. But if the currency that you're trading in, if the metric you're using using for success now is practice, um, different images for your website and portfolio, launching a new line, like getting enough images to come to the marketplace with, then the currency is totally different. And if you have sales, those are a happy byproduct. What I like about doing that is that when I'm in the camera room, I'm much freer because I'm not trying to please anybody. I'm not worried about if mom's going to buy it or if mom's going to even understand it. I'm worried about creating what's in my head that I've been researching and holding on to and and kind of growing in my brain, bringing that out um, in the camera. So You can find subjects many different ways. Maybe it's existing clients. Maybe it's putting out a call and um, and maybe it's an application process. We do that quite often too. The other thing you have to think about is, okay, well, in order to create that look, that line, that work, what's the gear that you need? And so for us, it's always Sony. It's always Sony Alpha cameras. And I love sharing that because we started shooting with Sony long before my relationship professionally with Sony began. And I, it's a very fair statement for me to say that there would be no black label portrait line had it not been for Sony because the images are so low key and the shadows are dark and the clothing is dark. And on my previous camera system, I just wasn't getting the information in the files that I needed to sell wall portraits. And so it almost didn't happen until a dear friend of ours, Jason Etzel, said, you know what, I think you need to try some Sony cameras and see what you think. And we did, and we never looked back. 
but it's important to understand the gear that you're going to need to to create the art you want. Is it different lighting? Is it a different camera system? What lenses are you going to use? I think that these projects and experimentations are the perfect time to play with new lenses and try something new. And then when push comes to shove, you've just got to start creating. You've just got to start shooting. This was the initial um, images that I came to the marketplace with for Black Label six years ago. They're nothing, they're nothing extraordinary. They're not amazing. Um, my work certainly has developed over the last five years, but they were different. And my clients hadn't seen that before. And they called, they, they called because of these portraits. So just start creating because you can't make art out of good intentions. As you start, as you start practicing and um, experimenting, you'll see that you're going to develop your style. You don't want it again to just be a copy or a mimic of somebody else. You want to create the work that you want to be known for. So for for me, when we developed Black Label, I made a commitment to shoot at least one session every week for 12 weeks. And the way I did that was I booked in the hair and makeup artist three months in advance. I went ahead and booked all of her days. And there's nothing to get you moving like having that commitment. And some weeks we had people booked way in advance. And some weeks it was like Tuesday night. She was coming on Thursday. And I'm asking the hostess at the bar if she would like to come in for a shoot Thursday morning. So you just have to, you will figure it out when you're being held to account. Um, and so as we started shooting, as I started playing and practicing and refining, then what I found was I was creating work like this. And it was just something that... Um, was really speaking to me. And it wasn't until I started going back and editing the sessions and editing the work. Sorry, I'm not sure what is, why my slides aren't changing here. Um, it was not until I go back into Lightroom and sit there and call the session that I start seeing things that are familiar, right? It's not that I cut out one of those pictures and brought them into the camera room and said, okay, now I'm going to pose you like this. It's because I studied for so long and just just absorbed myself in that work, in that style, that when I saw it unfolding in front of me in the camera room, I knew it was right. And that's when I got the shot, if that makes sense. So same thing here. I was creating work like this. And then as I'm editing, I'm saying, huh, that's, that's where that's coming from. It's those reference points. And that's why it feels good to me, because that was the work that I was attracted to in the first place started doing group shots like this and thinking, okay, that's, that's referencing what I've seen that got me in this, the style in the first place. I took this image of a high school senior and I thought, why is this so familiar to me? And then I realized, oh, okay. And it's not, I'm not by any stretch saying that my work is as good as those artists. I'm just saying those were the reference points that began to shape the look and feel of my work. And so we can't skip over that really important piece of researching and developing and and really studying and, and getting fully immersed in, um, in the work that we're attracted to. And so I did a dance project uh, two years ago, and then I allowed myself to really experiment and play with different lenses. I took the 84 1.4 G Master, and I moved around the set. I took it off of the camera stand and moved with it and just tried to experiment with some new things. And this became my favorite image of the whole of the whole series. So um, I also tried just taking um, the modeling light and seeing what I could do by pushing that ISO on the Sony and what how that looked different than just a strobe portrait. And so as you experiment, then you'll find things that you do like and find things that you don't like, and that will shape where your work goes next. Okay, we good, Derek? Yes, we are. Okay, perfect. I'm going to keep going. So you've had this time, whatever time it was that you allotted yourself. And I always say like, 
pick your date, your drop dead date. So we're working on a line right now that um, we want to la- launch in the middle of May. So I kind of work backwards and I say, okay, what do I need before launch? How many images do I need before launch? And then how can we bring all of this about? How can we make this happen? So for Black Label, I always think everything does better if it has a um, a logo or a brand mark or a name, something that people can ask for. Otherwise, they don't know what to call it. They don't know. They've seen something, but they're not really sure what it is. So I think that that's really important. Um, hang on. Let me just move ahead here. Come back to. Okay. Um and so the you so you need that brand mark, but then you also need enough images that I think the biggest mistake, one of the biggest mistakes we make as photographers is we shoot something that we're really excited about and then we put it on social media and and then we post for a couple more weeks or a month our regular work. And then we get another image that we really liked for this kind of new feeling. And we post that on social media and then we post our regular things for a couple of weeks. And so what's happening is if they just look like a one-off, it's like, imagine you went to a fashion show to fashion fashion week and the designer sent out one skirt and then they invited you back a month later to come out and see the top that goes with it. It doesn't make sense. It's not impactful. It's not significant. It's not, um, it's not, it doesn't feel real. And so we have to look at it the same way. We have to build up a body of work, a library of images so that when you come to the market, that's all you show for several, several weeks weeks, months even, so that people understand, okay, this is a thing. It's legitimate. It's not a one-off. It has a name that people know what to ask for. It has a distinct and recognizable look and feel. And it's different. Again, it's got to be significantly different than whatever else it is that you have already showed your clients. So the idea is that when you come to market, your Instagram feed starts to look really cohesive and it looks like this. So when we launched Black Label, that's what it looked like. It was very clean and very identifiable. When we, hang on, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and find my slides for when we did the dancer project, I did it the same way. I did a a project called Art of Motion and I didn't know anything about dance, but I always wanted to photograph dancers. I just think it's this beautiful marriage between athlete and artist. And so I started to look for where is the inspiration going to come from, you know, starting with the classical artists and, and like Degas, what, what's, what's the, what's appealing to me about this. I did the same thing with the Pinterest boards that I talked to you guys about a minute ago. I got absorbed in coffee table books of the work and just said, what do I like? What do I don't like? I started building the portfolio so that I had something to show. Again, you don't make art out of good intentions. So I got really disciplined and I went ahead and booked my calendar out for several months about when I would start shooting these dancers. And I just started playing again because there was no expectation There was nobody I had to please. I could just shoot what I wanted. Some of it I liked, some of it I didn't. But it gave me a nice round body of work as I played and I experimented. And then again, as I was able to come forward with the work, it was just a nice clean feed. I mentioned experimenting. I played with that 85 and shot black and white kind of motion images. So that was something really unexpected that I didn't think I would love. And I did. I shot this with the 135 on the modeling light and I loved it because the background just, this is unretouched. It's straight out of camera. I don't even need to do anything. That lens is so gorgeous. The background fades away like a painting. The skin tones are beautiful. And so I just started playing with new poses, with new outfits, with new lenses, and it just gave me such energy. Now, I think it's important when you do work like this to have that finished end in mind. You need to be able to communicate it to the clients that you're asking to come in and model for you. So, um, and you need to be able to know what the, what the end game is for yourself, for the black label line. It was bringing a new portrait line to the studio 
for the artists, for the dancers, it was strictly an artist project. It was during COVID. These dancers weren't getting to do any of their um, typical performances for audiences. So we had a virtual exhibition and that was the end game. And so we did the whole thing. It was literally a virtual exhibition that you could walk around um, virtually through the gallery and see all the different pieces of work. And the way that came about was I had to create a few images first and use those to get more people in for the project. I had to have something to show, a sample to show. So sometimes your projects will be in two pieces. You might need to shoot a couple of images just like this so that you can use to build up the excitement. Then we put the project out, people had to apply. Then we chose the people who would um, be selected. And then we storyboarded out sessions and became really intentional about what these 40 sessions would look like. And we came up with this finished um, gallery. Whoops, I was thinking it was gonna let me play that, but it might not. It might not let me play on Zoom. But anyway, it's a virtual gallery that you can walk around. So understanding what you want to end up with is going to be really important in driving you there intentionally. So right now what we're doing is I'm, I'm working on a new line, kind of a little bit more inspired by Gainsborough. And so what I love about his work is that idea of kind of a landscape behind people that we know that person wasn't really painted outdoors, but it's this kind of surreal um, surrounding. And so I'm thinking, well, how can I make that work kind of a little bit more with a contemporary flair? And so I've started playing with really cool backgrounds um, that I find in very unexpected places. And I start thinking about, well, could this be like a modern version of that? And so I'm just experimenting with it. And these really haven't, I haven't been sharing these online because I wanna, I wanna get a, a more complete body of work. But this family came in and she wanted, she showed me examples and I thought, wow, that's really, really beautiful. And how can we do that um, in a more contemporary way? So this is the same idea, kind of that, uh, landscapey background and just beautiful images of mother and daughter that I, and the rest of the daughters that I really love. Here's that initial background again. Um, just trying to show a little bit more dreamlike quality. And then this one I'm obsessed with. I don't know how I even did it. It was just playing and, um, and it kind of all came together. And when I, was editing, I thought, wow, it's kind of like this combination between Alice in Wonderland and Wuthering Heights, right? It's like this beautiful mix of the two. And I thought, how can I do more work like this, where they have some kind of a surreal background, but it has that nod to, um, to the classical paintings. This is one of my favorites where I thought, okay, well, if I layer solid backgrounds, why can't I layer some of these painted backdrops? So I'll be doing more of that. And then we did this of um, three little grandchildren, three little sisters that you just kind of don't know quite what to do with it. Is it a portrait? Is it a painting? What is it right? Is it wrong? You know, and I like I like that um, it has that ambiguity to it. So that's kind of what I'm working on now is a whole series of images like these that have much more color than Black Label. They're much more, the backgrounds have much more um, pronounced markings than Black Label. And it's kind of almost the opposite, right? It's almost the opposite of what I've been doing. It's kind of coming out of that and saying, okay, well, what's color and what's, what's intricate and detailed and um, what's next? And so, like I said, I love Black Label. I'll always shoot it. It's, it's, I think it's just a, really beautiful classic modern line, but um, but I'm I'm interested in playing with something that's a little bit kind of diametrically opposed to that too. So that's what I've got. Wow. Always bring in the inspiration. I love the direction you went in the beginning. I want to flip it back on you. Is there anything that you have Feel, that you feel like you haven't tapped into or a style or something that you've been holding back on or any direction in your work that you feel like 
I'm on the way, but I'm not quite there. Yeah, I think that um I think that for a long time, especially as we start our businesses, we are overtaken with that idea of having to create something sellable, right? Something that our clients will want to purchase and um, and that's how we make our living. So I think what happens if we don't allow for projects and experimentation like this is we just get in that rut. And so I'm not sure what happened to me this year, but um, maybe the last couple of weeks of December, I just started to feel like maybe it was turning 50, but I just started to feel like, okay, what, like just create the work, like create the work that you want to create. Stop looking for approval, like come with the work that you're excited about and that is really feeding you and your clients will pick up on that excitement and that energy and they will want it because you're telling them it's the next best thing. It's the next great thing. And so it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I found that I was getting too scared to show what I wanted to show. And, and I wasn't being bold enough in the camera room. I wasn't being daring enough. And so black label was a good start. Um, But I think this new direction that I'm starting to go is so different than what I've seen anybody else do. And it's really kind of like marrying, like I said, classical artists like Gainsborough, those landscape backgrounds with something today and trying to figure out what what that is. And so for me, I think what I what all of this is going to is what I said 23 years ago when I started, which was one day. Somebody will, people will pay me to just create a portrait. They're not going to really have a say so as to what it's going to look like or what size or what this or what that. It's going to be like, I need a portrait of my son and I want it to be commissioned. I want to commission it from Monica Sigmund. And then, and then the idea is that you create the art. And, and that's what they get. Right. And so I think that, um, I think we're close at our studio. We have so much, we have really good systems in place that we've talked about on here before, where by the time we get to that selection appointment, they're really deferring to what it is that we're recommending. And, um, so I think we're close and I, and I have had some people just say, you know what, will you just pick it out? Just, you know what I want, you know, where it's supposed to hang, just pick it out and frame it and do the whole thing. And so what I would like is to be at that point where it really is like, I I want a Monica Sigmund or I want a Sigmund Taylor. And I just want you to do it. Like, tell me what to wear, tell me what to dress my child in and, um, and just do the thing, you know? So I think, I think that's, I, I I'm being, Already, I'm just noticing I'm braver with this new stuff, and I'll be bolder with that. And um, and I think that that's where that's where we're headed. That's where I want to head. That's great. I mean, it shows like hey, Michael. Can you turn that down? Sorry, everybody's listening to our voicemail on. <laughs> oh, you're good. We can't hear things, so you're safe. <laughs> um, so that's where I, I, that's where I want to go. I just want to be brave and bold and do the work I'm supposed to do. But I, and I think it's great that you're constantly a student of the game, right? No matter how accomplished you get, no matter how many goals you hit, no matter how successful you are in terms of however you measure it, you're constantly right. learning. You're constantly staying in tune to what the industry is doing, but also what you're doing so that, like you said, your clients can come to you and say, okay, Monica is the authority. We're going to trust her vision. She's staying right. on top of what's what's cool and what's relevant for us so that we don't have to know right. these things. But then at the right. same time, you're not getting lost in the sauce, so to speak, where you're still bringing your own vision, your own creativity, your own unique brand to the table, which I think is I think is great. It's constantly it's you like a constant get, refresher. You can get bored. You're going to get bored and you're going to get burned out. And that's certainly what happened. I mean, last year I felt like a creative husk of a shell. Like there was nothing like I had nothing last year. And I just thought what is wrong with me? Like, there's nothing that's exciting me. And, um, in terms of new, like, like inventing something different and I just couldn't come up with it. And I was really trying to force it. And we all know that doesn't work. And, um, and so I think when you, when you find the thing and you really start getting in that space and being 
immersing yourself in it, then it, it comes pretty, it comes pretty naturally. It doesn't come easily, but it comes naturally. And then you just have to do the work. I think we all just think, oh, I, I'm going to be inspired by something and just start making the work, but it's not, it's not that it's how do you make it yours? How do you make it different? How do you make it exciting for you? How do you make it exciting for them? How do you make it um, logistically repeatable and consistent, something that you can continue to create, not just a one-off. Um, how do you fit it into your business model? How do you fit it into all of those things? So. I love it. You're definitely reading the Q and A because I'm like, she, she wants <laughs> your Q and A in here. Hold on. We got Q and A. We have the wonderful Jack Resnicki who got a, a question in. <laughs> you're, is that Jack? You're stranded on an island and can only bring one I, other photographer. I, we have Jack over here. Jack's on Vimeo. Jack <gasps> asking nice. about green screen use. Jack wants to know if you've oh. thought of shooting people on a green screen, adding backgrounds and post. He says it opens up a lot of options. Oh, there he is. I see it now. Hey, Jack. Michael's Michael's going to come running in from across the studio now that he knows you're on the call because he was sitting in the other room. But um. Yes, I actually have, particularly once I got that um, kind of Alice in Wonderland-ish image, I thought, okay, there is a whole world of these virtual backgrounds that I could be using and incorporating into these images that are kind of running around in my brain. I'm not sold on it. I'm not going to do it yet because for whatever reason, and maybe it's some kind of just deficit on my end, but it's the same thing when I shoot black and white, I actually change the camera settings so that I'm seeing black and white when I shoot it, because I, uh, to me, it just, it's just easier to see it as I'm going. And I, and I feel the same right now with these backgrounds, I might change my mind as I start to see more things that I can't physically create here in the studio. But right now, um, I want to, I want to, I want to be really immersed in that and see it. And, um, but I'm really, I'm, I'm fascinated by all of it, all of that, all of the AI, all of those things that, um, are just next levels of creativity. So I'm not saying I won't do it. I'm just saying, I don't think I'm smart enough to do it right now. So good answer. And Jennifer is asking if you have a link to that virtual gallery that people can go in and check it out. Yes. And it is, hang on, because we have it hidden. It's not on the um, uh. website uh, main gallery anymore. And it's sigmundtaylor.com. I'll put it here. It's sigmundtaylor.com backslash motion. And she can see right. it there. Perfect. And we'll get that dropped into the comments section of the live streams and we'll get it sent to you guys here in the uh the zoom chat as well jim is asking what are you using to get the muted tones in your photos um so for black label you know clothing is a big piece of that because the clothing has to be in key with the backgrounds and so i'm not going to have somebody come on set with like a bright red or um you know strong color that's a really vibrant color um so it's got to be in keeping with the backgrounds and it's funny because with this new kind of stuff I've been I was thinking initially oh this is going to be bright and colorful like the the one with the birdcage and the blonde little girl and I thought oh the whole line's going to be like that and before I knew it it started becoming that like that more neutral tan kind of background and the brown dresses and I'm like here I go dark again I, I just can't I don't know why I, I keep doing that, but um, so I think a lot of it is clothing and then um, a lot of it is just kind of taking down some desaturation and just playing with a little bit in post. I don't have a recipe per se. I don't have actions or anything like that. Um, it's just kind of playing around with it and um, trying to get that mood. I think it's a really important part of the mood that I'm trying to convey. Mm -hmm. Now, how much of these sessions are, do you ever freestyle? Do you ever go and say, eh, you know what, I, we planned it like this and we discussed this, but we got to call an audible, we got to go over here. And, and then how much preparation goes into certain looks? Is there ever something where you talked about, you know, having the Pinterest boards and the mood boards and all that? Do you ever go in, you know, is this something where you're 
showing the mood board to the clients when you're sitting with them and saying, Hey, I kind of like this idea for your family. I think this would be cool. What is that process like if you can open it up a little bit? Um, first of all, I think audible is a sports ball reference. And so, um, <laughs> Guilty is charged. Guilty. Um, <laughs> no, so it's a great question. Michael used to make fun of me and he still does all the time because he goes into a session totally blind. He loves like walking around, seeing things for the first time and putting it together. I'm like, you know, for weeks, like drawing it, mapping it out, you know, storyboarding the whole thing. And, um, and then I get on set and nothing happens according to plan. And I start to get freaked out and then I might get something incredible, but I didn't get what I came for. So immediately following, I'm like, I failed. It's just this whole situation. I've gotten much better over the past several years and I've gotten much looser. And, um, and I think it's coming from a place of greater confidence because now I am much freer to see what that three-year-old wants to do before I was like that three-year-old is going to sit on that trunk and it's going to be lit this way and it's going to be and then I'm going to make that three-year-old do this and now I'm like oh my god the three-year-old's not going to do anything I tell them to do so I'm a little bit freer not as free as Michael I still like to have some kind of pre-planned things but um but I am getting better about that and I think we have to be nimble because Art, at the end of the day, it, it, there is a collaboration in there. No matter how much that vision was yours pre-planned, there is a collaboration. You can put a three-year-old in the set that you designed, and if they're not feeling it and you're not feeling it, the expression's not going to be there. It doesn't work. So you have to be nimble and you have to say, okay, this isn't working. This isn't, the people aren't the same height that I had envisioned when I thought of this pose or, you know, whatever it is. And you, you have to go to the next thing. So I don't know. I don't know what the, I don't, I forgot the question at this point. Cause I'm rambling. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's information like, that's getting out there. I'm like, did I, did I answer that? Yeah. I don't know. Michael yeah, would tell yeah. me that I'm still way too uptight. I don't know why he's not in here. I know he can hear me. Maybe he can't hear me. Um, I haven't triggered him enough yet. Yeah. I haven't triggered him enough. So, um, I think you have to be nimble. I think it's great to start with an idea. The mood boards help me more with literally just that, the mood, the mood, the overall feeling as opposed to a pose, if that makes sense. Totally. I mean, you, and you were definitely very intentional in getting that across during your presentation where it's like, Hey, this isn't meant to be a copy. It's Correct. inspiration. You're, you're inspired. And I think that's a great delineation there with the mood. You're really just deriving emotion and mood out of something. You're going to go about it in your own way. And I, I think you brought up a lot of great points just from the start today. Like I wasn't, I wasn't pulling your leg, you know, in saying that, that it was inspiring from the start that people can really take from these, these are or masters of art. That's why they're studying today. And it shows that there, it doesn't matter if it's photography or not. It's really just images and light and emotion and feeling. Color and, and color. yeah, exactly. just, and it's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. Michael and I will go on vacation and we'll be in a hotel and you'll see something like a wallpaper and you'll just be like, oh my gosh, that's, uh, I really like that pattern or that color. And it's just yeah. all these things that you file away. And because we're visual people, the more you can file those things away visually on a Pinterest board or on your phone, create an album, or even on Instagram, I'll save things to collections now. And so they're just visually reminding us of, again, maybe not that specific thing, but what did it make us feel? Our friend, Tim Walden, who we've done events here with you guys um, before, just a wonderful portrait photographer in Kentucky. He always says, we don't sell the art. We sell the result of the art. We sell how you feel when you are interacting with that art, when you're looking at that art. And so I think it's the same, it's the same thing when you're building the art. It's like, 
you're not, you're not responding to that exact thing. You're responding to how it makes you feel like you're, mm-hmm. you're the sum of the parts. What's the emotion? What's, what's the story you want to convey for me when I built out black label, it was because I wanted families to have their own iconic portraits. I didn't think that should just be for celebrities. And I wanted that split second of vulnerability that Mark Seliger always talks about. And I wanted it to be, when you think of your five-year-old, you think of that portrait that we made because that was so him at that age or whatever it is. So um, it's, it's feeling and it's emotion. It's the result. It's the result of the art. I love that. And it all comes back to like you were, you were saying, ask yourself the questions. What, what, you know, looking at the images that inspire us, really break them down and simplify it. What am I feeling when I look at this? Why am I feeling that? What, right. You right. Know, start to look at what's in the image that makes you feel a certain way. And I think, I think a lot of us don't do that. It's as simple as really just looking at anybody's work, your own work, the work that inspires you, something you, an image you don't like and say, why, why doesn't this image resonate with me? Yeah, I think most of us don't do it because that's not the sexy, exciting part. That's the time consuming, boring part, if you will. But it's really, again, I can't understate that creating those templates in your brain is so important because, again, you're not copying a pose, but you'll recognize it when you see in a camera room or you're you're inadvertently directing that shoulder turn in such a way that it's looking familiar to you because you've been so absorbed in that those images or colors or um clothing styles or whatever it may be dance dance or whatever but um you just it's not the sexy exciting part but it's it's the it's the foundation building that that you need to to make it last Definitely. I think that says it right there perfectly. You got to put the work in. That's the part you need, whether you want to have it or not. It's not fun, but it's like if you want to play in the house and the, you, the house is a mess. You got to clean before That's right. you play. That's, so, right. That's right. Monica, I want to thank you. And I, I'm going to throw this in there for Matthew had a question on my setup. Matthew, you can email me, Derek F at bhphoto.com. I will give you everything in my setup for how I look how I sound, how I'm lit, everything. So shoot me an email there. I don't want to hijack Monica. Wait, is somebody uh, wanting to look like Derek? I'm confused. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my little my little setup here. I put a lot of work into it. I, it, it, it changes constantly, but you know, yeah. you gotta, if you are the professional source, you have to look and sound like As you are the pros. professional I source. Love it. So I love definitely, it. but Monica, this is a perfect start to a long, long, long series. We have As some good stated. topics coming up. I'm excited for, and it's new content. So if you guys have watched Monica all over our channel in the past, don't say, oh, I've already seen it. You're going to get a lot of new content. As you know, every time we have Monica on, you're getting good information. So there you have it. So the next nine, 10 months are locked up for you in the event space. We'll uh, see you back here next month, Monica. But a huge thank you to you. And of course, Sony for hosting this entire series. And all of our viewers, huge thank you to you as well. Monica, one more time before you go, any closing words, any links that you want to drop for us? Um, I would uh, love to send you to our new education website, but it is not ready. So I can't do that. But Thanks, um, but find me on Instagram. And we are doing a podcast with some friends called The F Stops Here, which is hilarious. And, um, and I would encourage you to check that out. And um, we have big things coming, big things coming. So. Awesome. Well, check Monica and the podcast, the photography, the website, the Instagram, all that great stuff out. And uh, you can catch her back here next month on the event space. But that is all we have for you for today. Thank you, Monica. A huge thank you to Sony, all of our viewers, everybody out there watching, learning together with us. Another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space is in the books. Catch y'all next time.